now that we got that out of the way, beans and toast aside, we need to get uh, to the, the business we're after here. So uh, to set this up in case anybody missed it, uh, last week I posted a poll inside the group asking people um, taco on toast next week. Good idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I posted a poll in the group asking people uh, how often they're going out and trying to get new leads for their business. So this isn't just wait for somebody to email you or get a phone call or whatever. How often are you out trying to get business for uh, your business? And the vast majority, 80 something percent chose either rarely or never. So there was like daily, weekly, monthly, rarely, never. And 80 something percent voted for rarely or never. And I voted inside that category. But Pete, I noticed, you know, it puts the little profile pictures next to who voted where. I noticed Pete voted daily. Um, and so I think a lot of people do this rarely or never because it feels weird to cold call people or they're not exactly sure what to do. Uh, and you kind of have conjure up ideas of those slimy people that email you really bad pitches. Um, but my guess is, and I haven't discussed any of this in detail with Pete yet, uh, my guess is Pete isn't doing those slimy, uh, gross things to prospect leads every day. So the whole point of this call is to find out exactly what is Pete doing uh, to generate leads daily or to look for leads daily. See, if you finish that sentence uh, to find out exactly what Pete is doing, you might have had my wife on the call for a bit longer because she, <laughs> she has no idea. She just sees me go up the garden to my little man cave every day, and then I return at the end of the day, and hopefully money appears in the bank, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> so let, let me – the whole idea of doing daily – some form of daily business development is – it, it, it was in, I had to ingrain it in our business when we started. So if if I can just sort of tell a little story to set a bit of a scene here as to why I started this practice. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, um, when was it? Nine and a half years ago, I set up my first ever business. And I was really a freelancer, WordPress developing freelancer. But actually, I build myself as a WordPress development house, a lot like, you know, a, a, an agency of one, a lot like a lot of the people watching this call will will resonate with. Sure. And I got a few, I knew that I wanted to do this. I got a few clients. Uh, I was working evenings and weekends. And basically, when I was working four nights a week, plus some weekends, I handed my notice in and left. When I did that, I then had to start payroll, which in the UK meant that I needed a business bank account. So on October the 1st, whatever year it was, um, I set up a business bank account. My mum gave me 50 quid to open the bank account with. So I had 50 pounds in there. I then registered myself or had registered myself as a company and I got a bill for 40 pounds to a company's house. And it's like, I don't want to be in debt with anybody. So I paid the 40 pounds. So I had 10 pounds sat in the bank account. And then the dread sat in. Because I knew that in like three and a half weeks time, I was going to have to pay myself a salary check that we didn't have in savings. We didn't, ha I had a workflow, but uh, yeah, I was sitting there thinking, Gabs, my wife, isn't going to think this is a particularly good idea if I can't meet the bills in three and a half weeks. So I'm going to have to do something about this. So, you know, you call in a few favors, you do a few things, you, you know, if I can turn this around for you this week, can you settle the bill within like 48 hours? Yeah, perfect. Great. And I made the, made the check. I won't hold the suspense. I made the check. And then the next month it became easy and the next month it became easy. So it then sort of dawned on me, I suppose, that actually the, with any form of business development, with any form of outreach, there's a failure rate. So you can't go and wait until you need the work and then think, oh, bugger, where the hell am I going to get it from? And then be able to accommodate a 40, 50, 60% failure rate in cold outreach. It's, you, you waited too late. So the only way of combating that is to make it part of your daily routine. So you do something every day. And that could be as small as sending an email. Or it could be something as big as, and I've done this, gone down to London, I've paid for a train fare, I've gone and given a, a free uh, free discovery session, all to try and win a client. But that was my one thing that day. I didn't, I, you know, I worked, did other stuff on the train and this, that and the other. Sure. But it could be as small as a couple of minutes, it could be as big as the entire day, but every day you do something to try and win some new business. So when you put that poll up, um, 
I thought, yeah, well, it's got to be, it's got to be, I, I do it daily. I even have it in my to do it list. It, it's, I, I killed the one for today. I did it earlier. So it's now knocked on to tomorrow, the fourth one down, business development task. There you go. So that is, um, that, that's, why i do it it would just it made seem to make sense so do, um, does it shock you to see that because this has just been part of your everyday routine for years at this point does it shock you to see that 80 percent of people are not doing that it it does it does a little bit it makes me wonder it makes me wonder where people build a pipeline where mm -hmm. where's their security in knowing where the next web project are coming from so if i look at our pipeline in our agency i, I should say i i know a lot of the people in your group know me i'm you know and we we have a lot of banter in there we talk about malt vinegar and all this kind of stuff they know that i have multiple businesses so this is the kind of thing i do for my agency every day this is me sitting on your side of the table it's sure. not me being the podcaster or the the seo guy this is me being an agency owner and um, i have uh, we've got the next 11 or 12 projects already planned in our pipeline that like confirmed deposits either invoiced or paid you know but they're, they're booked in we know what we're doing for the next 11 or 12 projects um i don't know how i could sustain my team now there's our team's not very big there's nine of us but i don't know how i could sustain my team if i didn't have a pipeline that extended a few months in advance because if you're only literally working project to project what if that next project fails? What if they that it's not a good time for your client? You know, life happens, stuff happens. COVID happened last year. Nobody was going to make that one up, were they? Right. So, um, what? It, it's it's about building that security into your business, I suppose, and that that's something that helps me sleep at night. It helps me also know that if I go through a spell whereby we'll get onto some of the things I do in a minute, but like the actual practical stuff, but. It makes me know that if I go through two, three, four weeks of just constant rejections, well, it the, the bills are still going to be paid. You know, I'm the the, the pressure is taken off in that respect, and it also means that if I find a prospect that I've I've sort of approached and they're not a good fit, well, I can still say no to them. I'm not married to having right. to to agree to every project. So for people to say that they rarely do it or never do it, I. I find that a little difficult to process, I suppose. That's not a criticism yeah, of everybody. Sure. It's just, I, I've been doing it this way for so long, I can't think, it, I wouldn't do it any other way. And, and I'm wondering here too, like one thought I had during this was, this sounds like something that if you started doing it, you would wonder how you ever rode the roller coaster you were probably on before. Because uh, I reach out to people every now and then, and I, I put rarely in the poll. Uh, because every once in a while I do some sort of prospecting. Um, here recently we launched a little challenge and inside the first table we launched, we're kind of all participating in together. So right now I have a lot of incentive to prospect right now. So I am doing that mm -hmm. over the last like four days, right? Uh, but generally I don't do it a whole lot, but I'm wondering, you know, if it's something you got in the habit of doing, if you'd feel like, I wonder how I ever not did this before because I, I I often am on that roller coaster of okay I have a bunch of projects right now but if they all wrapped up at the same time uh, maybe something comes in this week maybe something doesn't and I think a lot of the people that put comments inside that poll were just saying you know I have enough business from referrals or SEO or whatever it may be coming into me that I don't need to go out and do those things so I wonder too if it's a place where uh, an agency like yours where there's nine people, you you have to do a lot more uh, feeding of that agency than an agency like mine where it's just me and one project a month. I could probably survive off of that. Um, Maybe there's a bit of that. There's a bit of responsibility with it. Although, so I told the story of my first business. I was a company called Coda Digital Media. And it was as I closed that business, I was headhunted for a job. Um, so I decided to take it and I closed that business. And that it was at that moment that we I met our mutual friend, Lee Jackson. So um, that was probably six-ish years ago now. Um, so since then, I worked for somebody else. When I started my agency that I run now, so um, 
it was really important for me that we built the business on recurring revenue. Now, that's maybe a slightly different discussion to finding leads. But ultimately, the sales process we put in place was that we didn't want to build re uh, recurring revenue just with any client because it's a bit it's a bit risky. Uh, um, actually signing client brand new clients you've never worked with before onto retainers. It's quite a hard sell because the values are normally quite large. It's it's uh, quite a big commitment. And if the people that you don't know that you're going to work with well, then actually you can set yourself up for a fail. So we wanted to build so with a basis of recurring revenue. And we run at about 60 to 65% recurring revenue in, in the agency now. Um, so we focused on getting those first jobs in. So we decided that to sell the recurring stuff, we were going to sell that to clients that we'd already done ad hoc work for, so a project work for. Um, so the pipeline therefore started by selling the projects to then upsell the retainers afterwards. And that was sure. kind of the methodology. And within six and a half to seven months, we'd covered our first bases for overheads, which was basically my salary, to be honest. I knew what I wanted to be paid each month. And to begin with, it was just me and my business partner. He had another income stream, so he was happy for me. And he knew I was going all in on this. So first of all, it was... Um, my, my salary, then it became both of our salaries. And then after that, it was dead easy to then make business decisions because, you know, should we get an office? Well, can the monthly recurring cover it? Sure, yes or sure. no? So, you know, I need a new laptop. Well, can, okay, that wasn't the recurring because we, we bought it outright, but is there enough profit to, right. to, to do it? Yes. You know, all of a sudden your decisions become black and white because you know what your business can afford on an ongoing basis. Should we take on our first developer? Yes, and, we can, because we can afford it. And I think that so, makes sense with, with going out and prospecting too, and the fact that you can make what your you can make your pipeline more predictable if you're taking more control over it. If you have zero control over it and you just wait for things to come to you, you're really at the mercy of whatever happens. Whereas if you're out proactively doing it, um, you, you take a little bit more control and have a little bit more foresight on what's going to happen. So I, I got two things here. One, I want to circle back to, because I had several people ask me, I want to circle back at the end of this conversation talking about, uh, you said you, you know, like the next 11 projects you have out. I think a lot of people struggle with how do you tell a client, uh, I'm going to be pushing it. You know, we can't start your project until X date. Uh, but let's save that for towards the end. I just want to say it out loud so I don't forget, but let's talk okay. about some of the practical things you do on a day to day basis you said you already did your tasks today what are the things you're doing on a daily basis to go out and try to fill your pipeline okay so i have a number of there's a number of things that i do and we do them on a sort of semi-regular basis so um the first one of the first sources for leads that i go to is uh, i'm a member of my local chamber the chamber produces a quarterly magazine one of the the way the chamber funds that magazine is it sells advertising, okay? There's no way that the people that are spending money on that publication actually know how far their reach is. But what I do know is the smallest ad in that magazine is 1,500 pounds. So that's what, about eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars $1,900, something like that? Sure. So we, um, one of the things I do every quarter to find uh, to, to find leads is I get the, the the magazine from the chamber. I make a list of all the companies that are advertising in there because I know they're spending money on advertising. That's the only way they've got in the magazine. And then I go and look for the, the appropriate people to speak to. Obviously, I'm a fellow chamber member, so I, I can approach them that way. And I build a list. And then I, as I said, some days all I do is send an email. I'll go to that list and I'll find a prospect that either has a website that needs an update or that maybe I can see that they've, you know, something's not right on their site or it hasn't been updated in a while or whatever it might be, because I know they're spending money on advertising and say, hey, you know, I'm a fellow chamber member. I've uh, recently seen you advertising in XYZ issue of the magazine and um, made me click on your website, you know, uh, and I noticed a few things. Uh, here you go. Uh, it'd be great if we could have a chat. Uh, maybe have a coffee or a virtual coffee, as it now is. And um, and, and that, that might be my one thing for the day. And I could have 35 emails on that on that list. I'm not the kind of guy that's going to go and put them in MailerLite and mail them all out in one go. I it, That 
that just doesn't work. It's not um, it's not personable enough. It's so, the spam emails we delete that come in our exactly, inbox. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So it has to be an email from me. So because of that, I build a list. And, you know, if I'm twiddling my thumbs waiting for somebody on a Zoom call and they're 15 minutes late, I'll just go and send an extra email. Because they're night. making just, beans on yeah. toast and... They, they yeah, while, while they're making beans on toast. You know, you, you made beans on toast. I might have just made 7,000 quid. It's, you know. It's about the uh, same, but, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the import taxes on those, if you actually source them in America. Um, I, I so would say uh, we did something similar like two summers ago. Uh, my, my son likes to get involved and I gave him a phone book. We still had like phone books and he mm -hmm. went through all the people that were placing ads in the phone book because those all cost money. And I set him over with a little air table base and he put in all the contact information and I gave him a system for rating their websites. Uh, and then that way I could just go back and sort that list through all the ones that, you know, their website sucks. You know, he had basically like, it's a good website. It's okay. It sucks. Uh, because I need to make it basic for like an eight year old at the time. Um, and he could at least do that. And then I basically had a database of all the people who I knew were local spending money on advertisement and had a website that sucked. So it's a, it's yeah. a pretty easy way to come up with a bunch of people. It's, it's that easy. So another, another way that I can do this and I can do this. Uh, I prefer to do this next thing from my phone or my iPad cause it works a bit better. So LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a great place to find leads, but you need to figure out how you approach the lead. Because, so on LinkedIn, the, the what I do is I'll go every so often, I don't do this every day. It makes me sound like I'm like, I, I don't have anything better to do in life. But you know, th this is just the sort of thing. This is, this is the thing I do at my son's hockey lesson. That's mm, okay. one of the key times I do this. Cause I'm sitting there in the stand, he's playing hockey and I've got 40 minutes to kill. So, I, am, I go onto LinkedIn and I search the posts in the last 24 hours for recommend and then web design or web designer or PPC or SEO, what, whatever. You can put anything after the word recommend. And I search the posts. Then I order them by latest. So you've got the newest ones at the top and the oldest ones at the bottom in the last 24 hours. If you go, you could do it for a week, but you've got to be aware that by the time posts are getting a week or so old, people have probably made decisions. They might have hundreds of comments on them. So, right. you know, you're, you're probably fighting a losing battle. So I then go and find these posts. Now, I don't comment on the post because if you comment on the post, all that you do is you say to your network, Pete Everett just commented on Bart Simpson's post that says, hey, can anybody recommend a great web designer in the UK? Yeah. And all of a sudden, I now just attract everybody that's connected to my network that also has uh, a web design agency to comment mm. on the same post. So I don't want to do that. So I go to invite. And then I go to personalize invite. And I send a personal message to the person that's written the post saying, hey, Kyle, I saw your post about looking for a, a, a web designer here in the UK. My name is Pete. I run so we do X, Y, Z. I've only got 500 characters. It's a relatively formulated message. But then I send the personal invite. And the key thing is I end the invite by saying, if you would like to arrange an initial chat or a, a quick call, please accept this invite. So I'm not waiting for somebody to then come back to me and say, hey, yeah, that'd be great. Because as soon as I see click invite accepted, I can go back with a second message and say, hey, that's great. I'd love to connect with you. Here's a link to my Calendly. Please feel free to uh, you know, pick a slot and we can discuss your project. And that's, that's something that I can do, as I say, at my son's hockey match. It does, I find that the search filters and whatever, you can do it online, but the search filters and whatever work better if you've got a, 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 a phone or something. That, that The app is just a little bit more streamlined. So there's another way that, you can just go and find some leads. And so what's your success rate been on something like that? I've, I get, I, I don't track exact numbers and you probably need to speak to Noah Britton about tracking leads and stuff. Cause he has right. like monster air table, like right. envy when it comes to that. Um, that's partly because I'm often doing this at my son's hockey lesson and then don't ever yeah, go I mean, back and just a general idea. Does it work table. one out of every um, hundred times or? Oh, no, no. It's it's a lot more than that. I'd say I get an accept probably four out of every 10 invites. Okay. And then of that, I then maybe have, uh, the, from there, then the success rate goes up, to be honest. Because if you then invite somebody to your Calendly, I'd say probably 70% of those then go ahead and book a call. And then off that, 
I don't know, you then may be looking at another 40 to 50% then accept a proposal. So you, you have to do a number of them, but for 40 minutes sitting in a car park, it's it's 40 minutes well spent, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, it's things like that, that, that look, one of my now biggest clients, um, which is a, a national group of um, healthcare centers in the UK. They have 23 healthcare centers in the UK. Uh, I won them using that exact technique. Nice. And nice. they have paid me to date around about 55,000 pounds. And they're on a £1,500 a month retainer. Yeah, you just never know sometimes when you when you make, uh, you know, uh, introductions like that, what it's going to end up leading to. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's, uh, I wouldn't have had that client. That's a serious chunk of cash to to miss out on just because I hadn't been filtering through LinkedIn. And, you know, and I didn't therefore go and advertise it to my network that I was contacting XYZ at the Huntercombe Group. Sure. Yeah. And it makes you, I, I was worried you were going to say like, it makes you look a little bit desperate that you're just uh, answering every post. Um, we do have one <laughs> question here. Uh, William Cobb asked, Pete, do you send a follow-up emails if they don't respond? So I'm guessing he's talking about the invites you're sending out uh, in LinkedIn. Um, occasionally, occasionally. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, occasionally it the 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 thing i find is because i often do them in chunks so with the linkedin thing of course once you've got the filtered results it's easy to go and send five yeah. or ten out at a time um if there's one that jumps out at me then i may well go and follow up on that but i don't have an automated process i'm not that organized sure. uh, there's no there's no bot involved or software it's me and uh, i have an evernote with um with some like sample uh standard sort of invites in there but I, I always edit them make sure it's got their first name in and that kind of thing but i don't regularly then schedule something 48 hours later to go and follow gotcha. up if they haven't if fair they enough. haven't invited fair enough all right well that that's two that i think anybody can do the finding your chamber magazine might be a little bit harder but even look in the local newspaper those ads are freaking expensive you know so yeah uh, there's definitely always places to find where or facebook who are you getting served ads from locally you know you know yeah. those people are spending money but please, if you don't want to work for electric shops, don't go and approach any electric shops. I mean, sure. you know, you, it's, all, it's also the start of you filtering out the clients that you want to work with. Um, but ultimately what you're doing is you're putting yourself in a position of power where you can, you can control the pace and the flow without having to panic about it. Because the minute you have to panic about, oh my God, how are my kids going to eat this month? All of a sudden, your your standards drop. You look desperate. You'll accept anything. You'll agree to anything. You don't really vet who it is. You do all of the, the the dominoes start falling at that moment. So it's about being proactive while you're not reliant on it. That's yeah. kind of my biggest sort of advice, I suppose. Sure. Next thing you know, you're feeding your kids beans on toast every day for like three months straight. Mate, that's that's going to lead to one hell of a queue in the bathroom every morning. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Hopefully I can make it through this call after my two bites. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm good till 9 a.m. tomorrow, so I can, I can power on through. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, do you have any other tips people might be able to use? What are some other things you've been doing? Uh, so, the uh, right, another, uh, for the next thing, don't be afraid to ask your existing clients for referrals. Now, obviously, only do this if you've had a good experience with the client. <laughs> That should a go project that's saying, gone south. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I hate to state the obvious, but a project that's gone south, you probably want to just finish and move on from. Um, but yeah, so um, one, I said I did, uh, I did my task for today. So my call, my business development task for today was a um, a referral that came in from another client after a task a few days ago was to email them to thank them for their work say what a privilege it had been to work with them. They didn't need any extra support going on, so I didn't offer anything. But instead, I asked if they had anybody that they could refer on to me um, for a similar kind of project. They replied, call was booked for this morning. I spent 20 minutes on the call with a lovely lady called Rosie. That's awesome. So don't don't be afraid to go and do that. It is, it is amazing that... Um 
I guess, I mean, we do this. Look, if uh, you're in the business of website design and development and you spend a lot of time with other people who are in that industry, you know a lot of people in that industry. People that are in whatever industry know a lot of people, whether they're competitors or not, or they know yep. a lot. Business owners tend to run in circles with other business owners. So chances are they know somebody else who runs a business, runs a similar business. You know, uh, your chances are much better asking your uh, your client for a referral than asking a random stranger or just a friend who works a nine to five job. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You're there's, there's very little point in you. Um, yeah. In, in you just approaching sort of random people asking if they know of people that can do X, Y, Z. That said, that said, if you are, if you are starting out, and you're you're really running short on a client base. You've not connected into the network, you, you know, a network of your own properly yet, et cetera, et cetera. Going to your friends and asking them if they know of people that's that's not a bad way to to start. But I sure. would move away from that as soon as you possibly can. Really, it's uh, it's not it's not a sustainable means of growth. It's a means to an end, which is to get you going, and then from there you can then move that tactic to your client base that you've then built. Yeah, you keep um, widening widening that circle every time when you add more people's circles to it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, the, the other thing that, and this maybe goes back to right to the first point that you mentioned about how do I feel, I suppose, about people that say that they rarely or never do this. We build websites for people. Websites are the biggest marketing tool on the planet. So if you're helping people with your marketing, with their marketing, why aren't you marketing yourself? Um, you know, if that might be that you need to class yourself as one of your own clients a while and give yourself a little bit of TLC, go and don't feel bad about taking two hours, one, uh, you know, one afternoon a week and doing some work for your business rather than for your clients. If you need permission for that, I've just granted it to you. Go and do it right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's this weird uh, it's this weird place where if I pulled everybody in the group, uh, I would get a large number of people that say one of their biggest struggles is they don't have enough leads. But then at the mm -hmm. same time, we pull the group and say, okay, what are you doing to get leads? And most of them are saying they're rarely or never going out to do something about it. So I'm not trying to shame anybody on that because it is hard to put yourself out there. And, you know, a lot of us are into website design and development because we can sit behind a computer screen and we don't have to interact with people, you know? So a lot of times you see, that's just like the personality type that's attracted to doing this kind of work. Uh, but when you're running a business, you owe it to your business to feed that business. So I think it's, you know, it's just kind of a weird thing where uh, people say they need more leads, but they're also not going out and doing all the things that would proactively get them leads. And that's kind of what, yeah. why I wanted to have this conversation in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good point. And, um, you know, it just, it just makes good sense. I guess that's the, uh, what's the alternative? That's, uh, you know, now, okay, I could go and employ a business development manager and then I could stop doing all of this stuff. But one of the, I suppose one of the things that you need to put this into the context of is understanding what success looks like for your own business. So I talk about this quite a lot on my podcast is, you know, I don't really want to grow a multi-million pound agency. That's That's not what my vision is. I want to build something that's, that it supports the people and the families that that are part of our network, that are our staff and their families. We we often do a dependency count in our in our agency, so they are all of the people that are dependent on our agency doing well. So it's not just our nine staff, but it's their partners or spouses, it's their children, it's their you know their uh, you could say their dogs. Okay, we, we don't include animals, but it's their you know all all of those people are reliant upon the nine cogs of our business operating efficiently and i am one of those cogs um so it's up to me to do my part now okay if if you're a, an agency of one or you're you're a smaller team of course that means you've got fewer cogs you've got fewer mouths to feed that's absolutely fine but where where's your vision of success what do you want to grow to and we as a company decided that our vision of success wasn't actually to grow much beyond nine or 10 people. We might take on another, we might take on two more, I suppose. And I recently posted a job for a developer in the, uh, the tab job board. So, uh, and, and, you know, got some really great responses from that. So uh, I'm not saying that you will never see us grow, but my target isn't to become a multi-million pound London based agency uh, that's looking to, you know, that that's too much hard work. 
I want to build a, a business that supports a, a good and happy lifestyle so that I can be more present for my kids so that we can, we don't want for anything, but you know, that, that they can have a great experience in life and all of that kind of stuff. That's my vision of success. Yours might be completely different and there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to put your sales pipeline in the perspective of what you're aiming at. Right. They have to be in alignment. And that's a good way to think of it too. That's uh, I bet most business owners don't do a dependency report, uh, factoring all of their employees and their dependents in there. So that's kudos to you for doing that. That's awesome. But even if you think about like, I don't like, I don't have motivation to go out and do this for myself. Well, think about if you have children or if you have a spouse, like those people are depending on your business, uh, not only sustaining the family, but also your well being in the business. And if you're on that roller coaster of I'm really busy and I'm stressed out now, I don't have any work and now I'm stressed out. Like you're not a big help to your family at that point either. Even if you are paying the bills, uh, you're not helping in other ways. So if you can't do it for yourself, you can do it for your family. Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, ultimately, that's where there's uh, kind of, I get sort of selfish with my time in one of three, three areas. So I'm either, I'm either selfish because I want to be with my family. I want to be present or I'm selfish because I want to take look, af uh, look after myself. Because if I don't look after myself, then that cog in that business on my presence for my family, that's going to be affected. And then the third is I'm going to be selfish for my business because that's what feeds the that that that's what feeds the ecosystem. That's what keeps it alive. So that might make me sound really boring. Um, but actually they're kind of the three the three things where I become a bit more structured, a bit more selfish with my time because they they are important basically in that order. Um uh, you know, they and it kind of then becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. So that's that's maybe a bit deep and a bit heavy for a, no. a chat about making leads, but that or finding leads. But no, that's but that's kind of my about, view on it. It's about finding that motivation to do it too, which I think is part of it. Just like you get complacent at some point, it's like, well, I have enough business and it's okay. And uh, <laughs> maybe that's not always the truth if you actually examined it. So uh, before before we end this conversation, uh, when I mentioned this to a group of people, they were really curious about the part where, uh, let's say, you get a bunch of leads in, <clears throat> you do this work, you get a bunch of leads, and then you realize, you know, the last handful of people you talk to, you really couldn't start working with them on their project for a month or two months or three months. How have you seen that as somebody who has a busy agency? How have you seen that working? How do you approach that conversation with people? And what's like a realistic amount of time you could put somebody out before it just doesn't make sense anymore? Yeah, I don't, I don't like pushing people out more than two months. Okay. That's kind of my, anything longer than that seems like it's too far away. Um, if I'm being honest. Um, now, of course, most new prospects are only really bothered about two things. One is when their project going to start. And the second is when their project going to be finished. So um, you, you can treat both of those differently. So again, this comes down to how you then plan your process in your agency. So of course, we have multiple staff, so we can handle multiple projects at the same time. If you are the kind of business that only likes to do one project at a time and see it through to completion, then you might have to think of a slightly different way of having this conversation. But we we can massage start dates and we can massage end dates. So we can, um, you know, we, we know that we all quote... Um, I don't know, five to 10 days for a web project, but actually those five to 10 days are spread out over eight weeks. So actually that gives us the ability to move around the central bits uh, as, as we see fit. The, uh, the first thing though is I have that discussion quite early on with clients. So I, I generally tend to know roughly when the next project will will be scheduled in for anyway before I start actually finding them on the chamber magazine or sending the email or looking on LinkedIn. So I kind of have a relative idea of when when it our next availability is. I if you then get two or three, the other thing is don't mention exact dates when you're prospecting. So we we are looking at the third week of May to start this project. If the third week becomes the fourth week, well, you know, I'm sorry, we we had we did have a, a project confirmed, so this this is your this is your slot in the queue. Um, the uh, that said, I also am very committed to not letting dates slip because I know how frustrating that can be. We were supposed to have some building work done that um, was supposed to start the second week of March, 
and the builder has now confirmed that he will start on the 7th of June. So that's that's one hell of a slip, and that's not something that would happen in, in my business. I wouldn't let that. I wouldn't sure. let that happen. Yeah, I imagine you have to be really, really uh, amped up about working with somebody or really, really desperate with no other options to wait, you know, five months, six months. I mean, I can't imagine how badly somebody would want to have to work with me personally versus any uh, available alternative to wait six months to work with me. So at some point, it's just not realistic to think you can have some kind of wait list that's, uh, you know, yeah. a year long, unless you're that good where you demand a one year wait list, <laughs> hey, you know? And if you are, you should be having this call and not me. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And you should be um, raising your prices tremendously. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the I had a thought come to mind then, and it's it's completely gone. Uh, the the other thing that, that was it. Um, the other thing that you do need to do with any cold prospecting is before you send that email or that LinkedIn message or whatever it might be, you have automatically made some assumptions about this company that they are a company you could be prepared to work with, and it's quite it's important that you establish that that is the case quite early on in the process. So you do need to have that discussion about budgets and pricing. You do need to have that discussion about timescales quite, quite early in the conversation with the prospect, because there's no point in you investing, you know, hours and hours and hours of your time on a couple of zoom calls, some emails, wh whatever, pre preparing a proposal only to find that they want this thing delivered in two and a half weeks and you can't start it for six. Yeah. So, you need to sort of have those kind of checkpoints put on put on you. But I've generally found if you're guiding that conversation, like you know what you're talking about. So the, the lady with the, S, um, it was an SEO call earlier, the lady with the SEO call, um, she wanted to know what the next steps were. Uh, so I explained what, what the process was. I explained where it's, the, uh, and then I just said, and we can start that. The, uh, it happened to be the third week of May. That's why I uh, pulled that as an example earlier. We can start that the third week of May. Is that okay? And that, so I, I got it in. I didn't, it wasn't a labored point. It wasn't, but I'd already set the expectation of, you know what, you can pay your deposit now, but we, we're not going to start it for another couple of weeks. So um, that was, yeah, th th there's ways and means, but you, you do need to have those discussions with cold prospecting as, f as early in the process as you feel comfortable. Yeah, and I just imagine kind of going back to where we started this uh, conversation and you, you talking about, uh, not really being able to picture not doing this, right? Um, I think just having at least, you know, if, if you're a solo agency like me and you can only be handling, I'm usually two or three projects is probably about my maximum bandwidth at one time. Like, uh, you know, some are kind of in a holding pattern, some I'm actively working on, some are going back and forth in proofs. If I get to four or five, I'm really overwhelmed by that. Um, mm -hmm. and for some people it might be one or some people it might be 10, you know, so that think about whatever your personal number is, but it's probably a, a wise move to always be thinking about how you can have at least one or two or three or four, depending on what your capacity is, uh, in the queue waiting for you. So you're not in that panic mode all the time, but the only way you're going to be able to do that consistently is, uh, you've just seen over the past year or two years or three years that you get that many leads that come to you and maybe then, uh, you're fine on this, but the, the only realistic way to go out and do this is to go out and actually do it, not wait for it to happen to you. And I think some of the ways you shared with us today on how to do that is definitely a nice way to go about it. Cool. Thank you. Well, I must say just, on that i've only ever had one argument with a client because i delivered something early so <laughs> you know if, if you have those full if you have that pipeline and somebody drops out for it could you know we we had an seo hive client recently that that dropped out because a family member had committed suicide and it's like my god i i can't even begin to to um understand what you're going through of course you know of course you we're, we're not expecting to do any work with you that right now that's absolutely fine you take care of yourself take care of your family and come back to us when the time is right but we then had that that meant uh, seo hive works a little differently but of course it meant that we then had an open slot that we could then put somebody else into and i don't mean that disrespectfully at all but sure. because there was a pipeline there it didn't affect us right. in a financial kind of aspect and you know my my sympathies still go out to that client. Um, I have had some contact with them since, and 
and it's just untrue. But stuff stuff happens that we're not in control of. That's really the point. Yeah, and I mean, even with your recurring revenue, if one of your big recurring revenue customers fires you, leaves, shuts down the business, whatever it is, you know, you don't want to be in that panic mode because you have nothing to replace that income with. So uh, being proactive about this is good. So uh, last in last week's email, so I've been thinking about this, this whole lead generation, finding lead things you can see from that poll we did. Uh, these things happen organically in my brain and then I get super focused in on them. Uh, so last week, as I was thinking about all this, I went back to a book I had read uh, that was about the sales process. And in there, he, he kind of of proposed a challenge of, uh, like you said, every day on your to-do list, you have business development uh, as a task you need to get done. He has a bit of a challenge in there that I adapted for our businesses um, where it's based on a point system. So every day you're trying to get four points. There's several different uh, tasks you can do all with varying numbers of points. And basically uh, the idea of the challenge is, is if you can score four points using this system, every single day, then you're going to fill your pipeline just because you're actively doing those things. So it's like, uh, contacting a lead, uh, scheduling an appointment, actually having the appointment, closing a sale, right? And all these things are worth different amounts of points. And if you're consistently getting at least four, then over time, those things are going to average out and you're going to be able to fill that pipeline. Uh, so as I've been thinking about that, I put that in last week's email. If you get our Friday chaser emails, you can go back and look at that. If you missed it and you want to try it out, there's some people in the group that are doing that right now. Uh, like I said, inside of our first table, uh, we're doing that kind of as a group, the eight of us, I don't know if everybody's participating, but most people are participating and we're kind of, uh, challenging each other and, uh, actually, uh, truthfully shit talking each other a little bit every day about who's <laughs> scoring the most points and kind of that gamification of things has been nice. Uh, but because I've been so focused in on this subject, I really thought about the problem with the challenge I put out in the email is there's no real accountability that goes along with it. You'd just be up to yourself to do it. So what I'm working, what I've been working on the past two days is putting together this challenge in a more, um, packaged way that's going to come with the uh how the challenge works uh the scorecard on how you can keep the keep score each day for three weeks and then it's daily emails uh monday through friday each day of the week uh so you get 15 emails through the sequence that give tips like the things we're talking about today uh you know check in with you hold you accountable let you know where you are let you know how many points you should have by this amount of time so i'm working on that as a product put out into the group uh i'm thinking next week or so uh I've been mm -hmm. trying to get that done as quickly as possible. But if this conversation uh, interested you, then definitely uh, keep an eye out for that. It's the uh, Prospect Pipeline Challenge. And hopefully, like I said, mid-May, all that would be out. You can check it out. And uh, hopefully that will motivate people to go out and do this. I know for me, I, I don't know if you're this way, Pete, but I'm super competitive. So when we started doing this in our table, uh, there's another person in there who's also super competitive. That's the person I'm shit talking with. Um, but <laughs> because we're going back and forth all the time, Yesterday, I had a 10 point day. So immediately I had to go in there and brag that I had a, a 10 point day. Are you competitive like that at all? Uh, sort of, sort of. I've always been the kind of person that, that just likes to get my head down and get my own job done. Um, but I, I suppose I set myself targets and, uh, and goals. So I'm kind of competitive with myself. And then I set punishments if I don't, don't hit them. So uh, some of you may know, t talking about the sort of taking care of yourself, some of you may know I do a bit of cycling. And there's, I live in Sheffield, which is called the City of Seven Hills, because funnily enough, it's in the valley between seven hills. And uh, there's one of those particular hills up to a place called Tankersley Manor that is awful to cycle up. So I will, if I don't hit targets and whatever, I often use Tankersley as a, uh, as a bit of a punishment to whip myself into doing them a bit better. But yeah, so I suppose I do it to myself, but I, I am kind of one of those maybe more solo focused kind of you know I'll, I'll just get on and do it kind of people it's funny how different people are are different for me man if i can turn anything into a competition i'm doing it uh we got <laughs> one more question and we'll wrap it up since uh thomas dropped this in here just less than a minute ago he says pete according to your experience on average how many potential clients do you need to contact in order to land one client um that's, that's a good question so we have a, let me. I'll work this backwards just because I don't want to get the maths wrong. So we have a 68% close rate on proposals. That is something I do track. So if I get a proposal, basically two out of every three sign up within 
sort of a month of, of receiving the proposal. So uh, past that, I don't I don't track it. Um, from there, oh, how does that work? So I guess I probably need around about. For every 10 leads, cold leads, I guess I'd probably be sending out two proposals. Okay. So I can't do the maths quick enough in my head as to how that how that works backwards. So we'll say um, uh, around 12 or 13 would get you uh, three proposals that are, yeah, two or three proposals. Uh, and then out of those, you'd close about uh, two thirds of them. About two. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you said for every 12, roughly speaking, for every 12 cold contacts, I receive two signed proposals. That's probably about right. That's not bad. One out of it's, six. And it's not. And as, as I say, some of these tasks take seconds or I use dead time, like sitting in the car park at my son's hockey pitch, at the pitch that he does his hockey lessons. Sure. So it's it's kind of like some of it is done in throwaway time. Other, others, of course, though, are you then speak to somebody like that big healthcare client. And of course, they, they this was a couple of years ago, we started working with them. They weren't going to sign anything without meeting me. So I had to take, put the investment in and go to London and meet them. Yeah. So it, it depends who you find. Um, but that's, and I try and, uh, you know, one of the things that COVID has been great for is getting people more used to doing business this kind of way. Mm -hmm. So that, of course, takes some of the expense out of travel and the time that's involved in this, that and the other. But on the same note, I actually kind of miss seeing some people. I, I like spending the day down in the big smoke and going and getting a uh, going and getting lunch and sitting and looking over Trafalgar Square, watching, you know, watching the world go by while, while you're down there and all that kind of thing. So it's not it's not all bad, the whole face-to-face -face meeting yeah, thing. things are starting to open well they never really shut down that much here but i'm uh, i'm fully vaccinated now so i'm feeling more comfortable going out now and having like my daughters playing softball so going to softball practice of interacting with people it feels really good again uh didn't really <laughs> realize i would miss it okay well pete i really appreciate you uh doing this with me i have uh several things i get to add to my uh list of things i could go out and do to help me uh, find these leads before we wrap this up. I know we mentioned several that we might've mentioned everything, your podcast, your agency and SEO hive, but, uh, I want to talk about all those things a little bit. So tell, tell me first a little bit about the podcast and why, uh, what you talk about on there. So the podcast is called retain FM. Uh, we, it used to be called the marketing development podcast. I changed it to retain FM around about the start of the year. It's a podcast for agency owners looking at, it looks at really the whole aspect of business, but the, the sort of common theme I suppose is about delivering and selling recurring services in, in your agency. And by recurring services, I'm not necessarily talking about hosting and domain renewals and that kind of thing, but actual services like SEO or pay-per-click management, uh, all that kind of stuff. So that's that's what the podcast's about. It's around about a 50-50 split of solo episodes from me and guest episodes like the wonderful Carl Van Dusen that has been a multiple uh, guest on the podcast. I don't think you've been on it since it rebranded, but yeah. I, I don't anyway. think so, but anytime you just have nobody better to talk to, you reach out to me and I do appreciate that. <laughs> so yes, that's, that's the podcast. Awesome. Well, what about uh, SEO Hive? I, I doubt a lot of people are going to hire your agency. Maybe you did say you posted something on the job board. So if you go to jobs.theadminbar.com, you can find uh, jobs posted there, maybe even jobs that uh, Pete has uh, posted on there if you're interested in working with Pete. But why don't you tell us a little bit about SEO Hive? So SEO Hive is a white labeled um, SEO service. So we help digital agencies to, um, we help digital agencies to run SEO retainers basically by we we do all the legwork. It's uh, packaged up in an affordable way into three pathways, which is content, uh, link outreach, and on-page SEO. And um, basically, yeah, we we help support you to to have that recurring revenue in your business. Next week, we're launching something called our Scout product. So um, SEO Hive. One of the pieces of feedback we've had from our customer base is that. The service is great, but actually they need the clients need some support in actually selling the retainers. Mm -hmm. So the Scout product is going to be a one-off product whereby we will go and do all of the reporting for you that you can then include in either your proposals or your discovery process. So that will be a, a, an, a health check, a, a keyword research, current keyword rankings report, link toxicity report, and a speed test, including Core Web Vitals. So that, that basically gives you a good pack to actually go and sell 
um, sell SEO retainers. And then, of course, if you onboard the site within a couple of months of, of uh, claiming that, then the onboarding is free uh, for that site. So that's nice. that's something that we're launching next week. Well, that, that works out well with this conversation, too. You can go find some leads that might need some SEO work, and then uh, you can run all this through SEO Hive and use this new program they're using to go out and actually close that deal. Yeah, that's that's the plan. So it, we're, we're really trying to support agencies um, through the sales process and the delivery. Um, uh, you know, uh, the the admin bars and you in particular and, and Matt have been absolutely fantastic in helping us get SEO Hive off the ground last year. And, uh, you know, we've um, we've changed a lot. We've learned a lot in our first year. But uh, we're, we're now in a position whereby our sort of core pathways, the processes for those are running really well, the, the accountability is good, the communication is good, all of that kind of stuff. So we can now start adding on these extra layers of sort of extra features, if you like. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, be it's becoming a lot more fun. I've spent a lot of time looking at processes in the last year, and it's fun to look at something else. Yeah, I definitely think <laughs> uh, the idea of helping people sell it is definitely the right direction, because I think that's where a lot of people probably struggle. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, uh, you know, it, it's, as I say, it's launching on Monday and hopefully, uh, who knows, we might even get a, a, a tab, a tab voucher code or something in there. We'll, like uh, we'll, we'll let you know. See, I didn't even have to ask. I just had to flash the smile and eat some beans on toast and we're getting coupon <laughs> codes, guys. Is yeah, the, the, the code is going to be Heinz1877. <laughs> if you give us a code, that better be it. That better be it. Well, yeah, awesome. you, you only get it if you can figure out how to spell the word Heinz. Yeah, no doubt. Right uh, as a reminder, here you go, right here. Boom, here we go. All right, perfect. Well, Pete, I appreciate this. I appreciate you coming here and answering these questions. We had uh, several people thanking you in here for this discussion. That's awesome. Uh, we really appreciate everybody checking it out. I did say we have about 70 people uh, watching live, and we will post this as a replay so everybody has access to it. Like I said, uh, keep an eye out for the next uh, week or so when I launch that prospect pipeline challenge if you want to kind of help motivate yourself uh, we're gonna have some of the tips that me and Pete talked about in here uh, as part of the sequence that will kind of help teach you on how to go out or give you inspiration on how to go out and find some of these leads plus a whole bunch more so hopefully it'll be helpful for people that are uh, serious about kind of changing their attitude on this and filling that pipeline up so Pete thank you again I appreciate it buddy uh, I'm sure you won't be a stranger and you'll be back soon Cool. No, really appreciate it. It's been lovely to talk to you, bud. Um, yeah, it's been it's been too long. We've been uh, it's, yeah. Anyway, it's been a while. People don't it's people don't need to ghost, see us sort of chit chat, do they? But yeah. That'd be a bad end to this. <laughs> no doubt. All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for joining <laughs> us, and we will catch you all uh, soon. Bye bye. Later. Stop streaming.